Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for turning up and braving the rain for today's uh, presentation, bright and early in the morning. And um, my name is uh, Tin Wee Tan, and um, I come from the National University of Singapore. And in keeping with the uh, Singapore spirit of uh, voluntarism, uh, one salary and many jobs, uh, they have appointed me to be uh, the um, chairman of the uh, A-Star uh, Computational Resource Center. So I actually work in my day job as a, in the Department of Biochemistry in the School of Medicine. So I apologize that I would probably look very much like a uh, fish in alien waters uh, in this community here at, in Cloud Asia. Uh, however, uh, I cast my back, mind back to 10 years ago when you know, a bunch of us, uh, including uh, Dr. Ngo at the back, and uh, I'm looking for Lee Hing Yen, is he in the audience, uh, who together with uh, many colleagues, uh, some of whom are in the audience, uh, worked very hard to build something called the grid computing. Uh, and as a result of that effort, the National Grid Office was formed. And um, the Grid Asia became a regular fair around this time of the year. So this conference, uh, if you notice, is called Cloud Asia 2013. Used to be called Grid Asia. And because I was applying uh, grid computing techniques into biology, and they call it bioinformatics, uh, so I was regularly one of the speakers in the Grid Asia conference. So I suspect that's the reason why uh, Dr. Uh, Li Hing Yen, uh, director of Singapore's grid office and maybe now called cloud office, I think, um, decided that when he changed to Cloud Asia 2013, that uh, occasionally he will drag me in to give a keynote speech or other. So you can see grid computing now has transmogrified into cloud computing. And very often people in academia are asked to look over the horizon and ask what's coming next. What's the next big thing that's going to hit us? You know? uh, what is this conference, Cloud Asia, going to turn into? Right? Uh, of course, supercomputing Asia has been taken, so we have to think of a new name uh, when that hits us. So uh, with that in mind, maybe uh, it's useful for us to ask not just the pressing questions before us in cloud, uh, the, the Cloud Asia Association that Bernie just mentioned about, but a little bit more forward looking into the future and ask, you know, what is the next tsunami of change that's going to hit us uh, going forward? And then maybe uh, prepare ourselves for it. And I hope to be able to make a little comment later on on some of the developments uh, and the decisions that have just been made in Singapore. Um, right. Um, I would try my best in the 20 minutes. I think I'm running short of time already, right? Uh, thanks to Linda, who's been very good at reminding people uh, to speed up. Um, I had one plan to talk about all these things, uh, but unfortunately, I may not have enough time. So I'll just quickly speed over to give a few words of introduction from my organization, uh, uh, who's, wh whom I'm representing uh, today. Uh, I, I represent the A-Star um, Agency for Science, Technology, and Research. And our mission is to foster world-class scientific research and talent for a vibrant knowledge-based economy. So underlying all this, essentially, uh, is in a large way in this knowledge-based organization, is the need for computational infrastructure to be able to support and underpin every stage uh, of this uh, research process, as well as every stage of the knowledge acquisition process and that involves a lot of computing. Right? So one of the largest users of computing essentially is uh, basically the Institute of High Performance Computing, uh, somewhere around about here, that comes under the science and engineering research. Uh, we typically get something from the government like 1.5 going up to $2 billion a year in terms of research funding to finance this whole engine of scientific and technology development and research. Uh, so we, in, at the A-Star Computational Resource Center, uh, we basically provide and provision for all these uh, resources um, that uh, allow us to support the five to 8,000 uh, research engineers uh, and scientists uh, in the more than a dozen research institutes that the A-Star organization uh, supports. So um, our 
main charter is essentially uh, to provide data center resources for storage, advanced network connectivity, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, high performance computing. And we house currently the fastest supercomputer in Singapore at an embarrassingly 100 uh, teraflop uh, as uh, signed the UAT a few weeks ago. So why I, do I say embarrassing? Because uh, in the next few slides, we will see that uh, in trying to provision for these necessary HPC components, and of course, we will be quite a major customer of uh, many of your companies out there here, uh, that um, in providing that, connect, uh, that, that, that computational hardware, software, storage, uh, connectivity, user support, visualization, etc., uh, we've had um, to look actively at not just um, doing uh, the procurement, right? We have to look a little bit forward into the future. Although we are not actively involved in our own research, research or product development, we monitor the state of the art HPC technology closely and engage in forward trends discussion with vendors, as well as thought leaders, as well as uh, the, the rest of the thing you can read. Um, the key thing is that it's this word, access scale, oh, I missed the S there. It's just to check whether I'm awake or not, so I am. Uh, access scale computing. Uh, is it the next big thing after cloud and big data? Uh, this is a very important question to ask because if we are provisioning for $2 billion annually kind of budget uh, for 5,000 to 8,000 researchers, we have to really think uh, forward to be able to provision for resources uh, long before it hits us. So what's exa scale? Well, it's talking about exa flop floating point calculations per operations per second. Um, and uh, this kind of computational resources have been, has been occasionally popping up in the press uh, in recent times. And this, this challenge is not that trivial because if you think about it, uh, we are essentially at the extra scale level trying to reach almost the physical limits of com computation computing as we know of right now. Obviously, cloud computing has done a lot to promote, uh, to spread the good news, so to speak, of HPC computing, right? So that it's sort of a democratizing process whereby we want to bring high performance computing to the end user uh, through the buzzword of cloud computing. Particularly with big data burgeoning uh, every day, uh, the so called digital data tsunami that's going to hit us, we really need the computational resources to help cope with that. So, uh, in that scheme of things from cloud computing to big data and possibly in the future exascale computing, uh, we are talking about the possibility of doing all those big things, big numbers that you see there. Um, so just Google exascale and I'm sure Wikipedia at least will give you a, a very nice um, breakdown of um, what kind of uh, uh, thing we're talking about. Suffice it to say it's big, it's very big. Okay, next slide. Um, so I cannot forget that I'm talking to a cloud audience here, so I have to quickly hasten to say that cloud computing is not uh, supercomputing exactly. Um, and I was searching for something to say to connect the two, supercomputing with uh, cloud computing, and I chanced on this very important document, the Magellan, uh, or Magellan uh, report in late 2012, uh, so, uh, um, so early 2012, that stated that the DOE, Department of Energy uh, of the U.S. government, uh, says that clouds cannot replace supercomputers. Now, many of you in the audience will quickly protest and maybe walk out, uh, but hold on because I, you might like to wait for the next announcement that I hope you could make uh, if I get the green light from my boss. Uh, and that's essentially that the two probably going forward would go hand in hand. Cloud computing will bring HPC to the community, democratizing process. The supercomputing community will press the limits, right to the physical limits of advanced computing to approach and approximate the possibility of real-time modeling and simulation. Well, what's that, real-time modeling and simulation? Most of you in the audience, I should be asking you the questions because you guys are the computing guy and I'm the guy from the School of Medicine in the biochemistry department. But according to my guys, they tell me that modeling is very important because, for example, if there were a, an earthquake somewhere and um, 
in that half hour to an hour time span, if we could carry out a real-time simulation and modeling of the computational fluid dynamics, etc., of that subduction trigger, we can actually predict long before, long as in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, before the, earth, the tsunami strikes the coast of, say, Japan, to actually trigger enough warning time to save millions of lives. So real-time computing and simulation is really important, something that we can almost carry out today. So it's important for us to note that if we could distribute and chop that into embarrassingly small chunks and then spread it out to cloud computing instances and try to compute that, my guys tell me it's not possible. You really have to roll in the big iron, so to speak, the supercomputing. Next slide, please. So, if cloud is not quite exactly HPC, um, well, what could we do about it? Um, later on, I hope I have time, if Linda will allow me, <laughs> to uh, talk a little bit about what we're trying to do in creating a so-called distributed supercomputing infrastructure, a supercomputing cloud, so to speak, such that in the same way that grid computing and cloud computing has allowed us to massively scale up uh, in, this, in that instance, uh, in the instance of cloud computing, um, embarrassingly parallel computational problems. Could we envisage the possibility in the future by marrying the two, some kind of supercomputing cloud might emerge? So in fact, as we speak, um, my, my, my colleagues in, in the ACRC are t um, procuring a Mellanox switch that can push something like 40 gigabits per second of uh, data across from memory chip to memory chip, uh, doing remote uh, RDMA, remote direct memory access. Because we have, as you saw in the slide earlier, two data centers which are approximately 1.98 kilometers apart. And we are running out of power to supply the X megawatt we need to drive these uh, machines. And the cooling at 17 story, you notice those tall buildings, why they put it at 17 story, I don't know. Uh, you have to ask my cousin who is in JTC. And the power and the cooling, the space is a tremendous problem. Could we cloudify supercomputers? Well, that's the thought, and perhaps this community here might have the answer, and certainly I don't. Uh, next slide. So not so long ago, a few weeks back, in, on April Fool's Day, and this is real, it's not an April Fool's joke, um, the first ever petaflop supercomputer was decommissioned. It was called Beep Beep the Road Runner. Uh, back in those days when um, the Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory in New Mexico uh, first procured this uh, for um, a huge number of uh, US dollars, one to one, which of course pales into significance with QE3. But in 2007 uh, was a time when they built it and commissioned it, and today they are, it's been replaced by an even cheaper Cielo US 54 million uh, machine, which is much smaller in footprint. Um, but just about at, at the same scale of uh, petaflops uh, in 2010, and now they are decommissioning uh, this, this Roadrunner machine. Next slide, please. So if you track all these supercomputers on uh, the top 500 uh, in terms of their computational power, uh, you can see a Galaxy S3. I haven't put the numbers for S4, but Galaxy S3 mobile phone is right down at the dot at the bottom. And uh, this is a lock scale, so you can imagine every bar there is 10 times, right? So, um, so people are envisaging at right now that it's almost a linear growth in terms of the computational uh, linear on a lock scale, right? Uh, which is exponential, right? Okay, so um, of, the, of the growth of supercomputing power. And that's up to 2012. So we are thinking that if the last 20, 30 years of, uh, of history is uh, going to be followed, it's very likely that the next five years or so, we are not too ambitious here, the next five, eight years or so, it should probably follow that, uh, that, that line. And if we were to draw that line out, next slide, please. 
Next. Yeah, thank you. And project as what my friend, uh, in, uh, who's the uh, inventor of the Tsubami computer in uh, to uh, Tokyo Tech, um, uh, Satoshi, says and tells me, and this slide is taken from him, thanks very much, Satoshi, that by 2020, 2018, wave a hand or two, right, we're going to have the capacity to roll in a power station with supply 20 megawatts, several football fields worth of supercomputers, and then reach something called the E-flop, which is the exaflop. We're currently around about here, right? the exaflop scale. So that's, of course, the front runners. The rest, maybe the 80% of the world, will then be talking about a, a bound below, which is the petaflop scale. You know, in the next five years, people in this audience who are from industry will be supplying cloud computing or computing machines or whatever, right, and computing solutions at the petaflop scale as a matter of routine, while the front runners are chasing the exascale um, range of uh, computing power to solve problems like real time um, modeling and simulation. So, this is uh, quite a good site to monitor the top 500. Of course, one of the top computers, Blue Waters, refused to be uh, benchmarked on this scale. So, actually, this is only a little tip of the iceberg, so to speak. So if you look at the number one today, you will notice that this is not surprising. It's the U.S. Uh, it has, ever since its Sputnik moment, when the Russians uh, managed to send, send uh, a little dog up into space and beat all the Americans, uh, they have in, in the, uh, in the 50, late 50s. Um, the Americans have been very keen, and there are some in the audience here, and very proud to uh, uh, push their technologies and to be the forefront uh, and preeminent in the area of advanced high performance computing. Um, so it's not surprising, number one of the top 500 is actually uh, Oak, Ridge, Oak Ridge's Titan. And of course the whole idea of HPC and parallelization was invented by Seymour Cray and hence Cray, uh, not surprisingly, Cray supercomputers uh, always somewhere in around the, uh, the top. But if you look at the second, it's a Blue Gene Q, uh, the uh, uh, Sequoia machine. And I'm very proud to show this slide because you can see there are many rows here, but uh, my outfit, ACRC, has just informed me they've signed a UAT for half, half a rack. <laughs> not even one rack right full it's half a rack right so we just managed to buy for a couple of million dollars um, in an IBM blue jean Q machine okay so of course we have Singapore and being Singapore we have uh, big plans here oh I have five minutes left so I better speed up and so um, the Jap Japanese have shot up with a K computer um, based out in uh, uh, the Riken at the uh, Kobe. And uh, w at one stage, Fujitsu's um, K supercomputer was the number one, but not for long because, uh, next slide, uh, the Chinese are not to be outdone. So even China has now the muscle to push one of their supercomputing su supercomputers up to number one status. Um, albeit for a short span of time, right? And this was like a wake-up call for the U.S. To re and the rest of the world to really move and get the, get the move on. So, of course, uh, this was a couple of years back. And after two years, three years, I think Singaporeans get the idea where the trend is, right? Uh, so, um, so these are some of my directors visiting it. Now, next slide, yeah. Next, yeah. So... Now, when developing countries start moving, then it flashes some red light for Singaporean government officials, you see. So if India plans to have the fastest exascale supercomputer by 2017, right, and, uh, and, and 
Of course, some, some detractors think it's a distant dream, and you know, Indians will be the biggest critics of our other Indians' uh, big plans, but we, uh, we pay close attention to what they say, right? So we know, let's take it with a pinch of salt, but probably uh, they might well achieve it. We don't know. And they are prepared to spend almost a billion US dollars to achieve this dream. The, uh, the, the, the K supercomputer costs about that amount, right, for a one petaflop scale, a, a 10 petaflop scale machine. We are talking about the same amount of money spent by the Indians in the next three to five years. I can see some eyes opening up here. You, know? <laughs> you might want to shift from cloud computing to super selling supercomputing supercomputers. Right? Well, one billion dollars. Next slide. Yeah. And uh, the Koreans are not to be outdone. Every 10, uh, 13 years ago, Koreans were nowhere in, in the mobile phone business. But today, every other person carries a Samsung or an LG right, next to uh, the iPhone. So we can see how Koreans also are moving in by passing legisl legislation uh, to, uh, to set up a national supercomputing and advanced networking uh, institute. Okay, next slide. Uh, we get really worried when Eastern European countries are also moving forward, but it's not surprising for Russia to move forward because it's a major superpower at one stage at least. So Medvedev, this is a bit old picture, next slide. But we really get worried when uh, the Slovak Academy of Sciences recently shot up to 498 and Singapore just fell off the radar screen of top 500. So we get really nervous when Slovak Republic, uh, they're quite advanced people there, and of course the Singapore government gets nervous when, when these things happen, right? So even cash strap Spain in Barcelona is planning for a, uh, 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 up to 100 million processors to build their, uh, their exascale laboratory that will research into scalable parallel architecture that are needed to support these very high levels of parallel computing. So, uh, uh, people are not just talking about big iron, heavy computing power. They are also talking about green, greenness in the uh, uh, computer. And uh, not to be overtaken by the US, uh, China has now put in place a scheme to hit 100 petaflops uh, in a couple of years' time. Japanese government has also announced that they are probably going to hit one exaflop by 2018. And that's not too distant a future here. So I would like to maybe end at this point because I have a lot of slides there. Right? This is only slide 20. Right? <laughs> but I'm told I have to stop. Uh, 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 previous slide, please. Yeah, I'll just stop there. That they, we have been working very hard behind the scenes. And over the last two, three years, monitoring these progress uh, in other countries, uh, the government has now made an in-principle agreement um, to finance a national supercomputing center. Uh, this national supercomputing center will include uh, not just uh, high-performance computing at only one petaflop, okay, a modest one petaflop in the next two years, but wait for it, we're, we're going to do something about that in phase two. And uh, we're going to build some advanced net networking up to the current state of the art of 100 giga uh, gigabits per second. But what we are working very hard about is basically aiming for phase two, 2016, uh, the RIE plan for, for Singapore 2016 to 2020. Okay? So I had hesitated a lot about showing this slide because it's not official, official yet. It's just an principal agreement. And secondly, I was an embarrassing number. People might think it's a typographical error that Singapore government is, is, is agreeing only to fund a um, embarrassingly modest uh, one petaflop uh, effort to build one petaflop when in the last 10 slides I've been showing you, people are talking about exaflops, right? We are like a thousand times behind. But of course, in this current age uh, and uh, day and age, uh, Singapore government is very prudent. We want to be very careful that uh, taxpayers' funds are not uh, squandered on uh, technology and to build a little empire here. But what we are trying to do now is adopt a highly nuanced approach towards funding 
the very inception of possibly a program which possibly might reach to phase two, depending on how successful we are in phase one, obviously, and whether we hit those milestones, to see whether we could lay the groundwork for possibly a supercomputing industry of some kind that we could move forward uh, um, in Singapore. So as I said earlier, the uh, Singapore uh, Grid Asia has now transmogrified into Cloud Asia, and who knows going forward, uh, this audience here may not be attending Cloud Asia anymore. You've got the association has got to change its name and to change it to maybe Super Cloud, maybe <laughs> Super Cloud Asia or something like that in the next few years. Given the dr dramatic developments that are taking place in these major countries, superpowers as well as developing countries, we're putting the tremendous amount of effort towards research in building exascale computing. And Singapore is monitoring this very closely. And we are probably budgeting, I cannot say the exact number, a nine-digit number of Singapore dollars in order to help us uh, clear through and catch up uh, in the 20 to t 13 to 2015 phase one um, phase one effort to build this uh, national supercomputing center to spearhead and drive our initial toehold. So one petaflop is a little toehold into this big business of uh, supercomputing. And we are already doing uh, a little bit of uh, uh, test bedding and, and a little bit, of, I wouldn't call it research, you know, simple things playing around with devices and so on, to see whether we could put up a proposal to the government for phase two to be able to put Singapore somewhere in the running uh, for advanced supercomputing going forward into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tan. Um, we, we are uh, running a little short of time, but uh, there is time for one quick question, if anyone has one. Okay, over here. Let me just give you the mic. Hi, Professor Tan. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm from CSA. So uh, my question is, while there's a race uh, and evidently the race to be in the top 500 might be uh, not so achievable in the near future. Um, is there a race for applications that can be used in supercomputers? Yeah, I, I didn't have time to show you a few other slides that I had where I wanted really to make the justification for Typically, my lectures are one and a half hours, right? So I only have 20 minutes <laughs> or so, and I think I've exceeded it by a fair bit. Um, and I wanted to show the reason why it's really possible for us to move into this space, because one of the key things is software development needs to change the way in which the kernels are being engineered, need to change in order to reach exascale uh, level of computing. So it's a whole big science uh, inside that space. So I don't have time to comment on it, other than to say that at one petaflop, we are not in a race, obviously. Right? Um, um, but we are monitoring it extremely closely, and if need be, we will be positioning ourselves in phase two, 2016 to 2020. So we have a lot of work cut out for us, uh, for us in ACRC, for example, and our community, larger community in, uh, um, in academia, National University of Singapore, NTU, SUTD, uh, SMA, and so on. Uh, our tertiary institutions will come together and really ask ourselves, can we make it, or can we be also a player in this big, uh, big, big uh, scenery of things, and hopefully, um, do, without spending humongous sums of like one billion dollars just for one machine, uh, we could be uh, a little bit smarter with our funds funding, and come up with a strategy that will allow us to maybe uh, operate in that space. But I've given to from to, to, uh, some friends in Europe has told me, and, and there are some papers out there that shows that the Europeans are very keen to make sure that they occupy this software space. So that has already been spoken for. Uh, so what can we do here in little red dot Singapore? Um, it's uh, up to those Singaporeans in the community here uh, to really help us and work together to find out uh, what niche we can carve for ourselves going forward into the future without wasting taxpayers' money, of course. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tan. If we can uh, give him a round of applause before we welcome our next speaker.